Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Rose, and I chair AIAA's Public Policy Committee, and I'll be your Master of Ceremonies today. Thank you for being with us for the 2019 Duran Lecture for Public Service. We'll begin our program in just a moment, but first, on behalf of AIAA, let me extend a heartfelt thank you to Lockheed Martin, whose incredibly generous sponsorship has made today's event possible. Thanks to them, we are able to network with our colleagues over lunch, learn about innovations in our industry, share knowledge, and celebrate accomplishments. So if we could please give them a round of applause. The Duran Lecture for Public Service emphasizes notable achievements by a scientific or technical leader whose contributions have led directly to the understanding and application of the science and technology of aeronautics and astronautics for the betterment of humankind. Dr. William Duran was a United States Naval officer and a pioneer in mechanical engineering. During his remarkable 99-year life, Dr. Duran contributed significantly to the development of aircraft propellers, and he was the first civilian chair of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, the forerunner of NASA. The Institute's Public Policy Committee takes pride in selecting accomplished leaders in aeronautics and astronautics who can share their knowledge with you through this lecture. And we have a distinguished lecturer for you today. To make the introduction, please welcome Ron Basir, Vice President of Engineering and Technology, Lockheed Martin Aeronautics. Thank you, John. Absolutely have the pleasure of introducing Doug Lavero, President of uh, Lavero Consulting, LLC, and former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy. Doug is highly regarded as a senior Defense Department space expert and leader. While on active duty, he led multiple space programs within the DOD and the National Reconnaissance Office, including Air Force's GPS program, NRA, NRO's future imagery program, and all the Air Force space control programs. As a civilian, he served as Deputy for System Engineering at the NRO, Executive Director for Air Force Space and Missile S Systems Center, as well as Deputy Program Executive Officer for Space at NRO. Most recently, he served as DOD's Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Space Policy. Mr. Lavero received his BS in chemistry from the United States Air Force Academy. He holds master's degree in physics from the University of New Mexico, an MS in political science from Auburn University, an MBA from the University of West Florida. Moreover, he was a distinguished graduate of the Air Force's Air Command and Staff College and Squadron Officer School. He was also a DTOP graduate in his class at DOD's Industrial College of Armed Forces. Mr. Lavero is a recipient of multiple prestigious awards, including the Secretary of Defense's Medal for Outstanding Public Service, the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Federation of Galaxy Explorers, the Society of Satellite Professional Engineers Stellar Award, and the Armed Forces Communications and Electronic Association's Benjamin Oliver Gold Medal for engineering amongst many other civilian and military honors. Mr. Lavero will now give us a presentation on guarding the high frontier and preserv preserving its capability for commercial use, what is necessary to assure a secure future for our nation and a thriving industry. As Doug approaches the stage, I hope you enjoy this feature video brought to you by Lockheed Martin. At Lockheed Martin, we're on a mission. Your mission. The one that lives depend on. The one the future depends on. The one that's unlocking new energy sources. Or the one that's uncovering enemy locations. Whether it's on the front lines, at sea, in the air, in cyberspace, outer space, or on the cutting edge of science. Your mission should never be taken lightly. That's
That's why when millions of people are counting on you, you can count on us. To build the impossible, to invent the inconceivable, to imagine new ways to get where you need to go, and give you tools that help you finish the job when you get there. To innovate, create, and solve every problem with speed and reliability. Because we know that missions aren't about getting around to it. They're not about crossing your fingers. They're about getting it done. They're about getting in, getting what you need, and getting home safely. Every mission is an expedition of the greatest importance, both to you and to us. Okay, well, uh, good, a good afternoon, everybody. I can barely see you out there with all the lights. I don't know about you, but I'd rather watch more of that movie than hear some boring uh, speech from some public policy guy. Um, Ron and John, thank you so much for the, uh, the kind introduction. And uh, before I forget, uh, AIAA, thank you for this honor um, uh, that you've uh, bestowed on me this year. The Durand uh, Lecture Award is quite prestigious, and I'm, I'm really happy to be pl uh, pleased to be the nominee for the year. You know, there's a lot of public policy things that I could talk about when it comes to space. Uh, we spent the last, I spent the last several years in the Office of Secretary of Defense trying to go ahead and see how do we, how do we marry U.S. space policy with national defense needs. And sometimes those seemed to be in conflict. But in most cases, they were actually in synergy. We just had to find the synergies, and I'm proud to say that we did a lot of that finding over those several years that I was, uh, was in the job. If you look back in 2010, uh, the U.S. issued its latest version of its uh, national space policy. And in that national space policy, uh, we talked about these three terms that sort of were coined to suggest some of the problems that we faced as we moved forward in space. Those terms were contested, competitive, and congested. We said space was becoming more contested, space was becoming more competitive, and space was becoming more congested. Uh, those three C's, as we call them, were critical elements in a lot of the policy discussions that we had within DOD. Today, I want to talk about just one of those. I want to talk about the notion of space congestion. I want to talk about some of the policy aspects of that and how do we make sure that it doesn't become a limit on what we do in the future within the U.S. So let me see if I can figure out which button does what here. There we go. Um, all of you have seen stories on debris in space, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, I want to I go ahead and first provide a little bit of, of illumination on the topic of debris, because I find it's one of the most misunderstood topics within space. It's typically folks either believe that it's something akin to a Sandra Bullock movie, um, and everything's going to go ahead and, um, and explode once uh, a single satellite is destroyed, or that it's something we shouldn't worry about. They seem to be on two sides of the spectrum, and the truth is actually somewhere in between. And then after we have that little tutorial which, in which you're going to participate, so get ready, put your, put your thinking caps on, because you've got to participate in this part a little bit, uh, we'll then talk about what do we do about the problem of space debris, the problems that we uncover, uh, how do we deal with regulation, how do we deal with treaties, and then what are the national security implications of those. So first of all, let me show you this picture. You've all seen a version of this picture. If you're looking at ge from geosynchronous office uh, orbit, or beyond geosynchronous orbit, this is what um, space debris tends to look like if you look at some of the uh, things that are on NASA's website or, other, or elsewhere within the general literature, a whole bunch of dots around uh, the Earth. If we then zoom in on that and look in, in LEO, it even becomes more crowded. Um, the number of pieces of debris within the LEO belt, and I call it debris, but it's not necessarily debris. Um, these could be active satellites, these could be rocket bodies, these could be CubeSats, which are just expensive pieces of debris. Um, that's not fair to all the cubic. That's not fair to the CubeSat guys, right? Um, so, um, but there's a lot of stuff there, and, and these, these pictures tend to go ahead and get people pretty, uh, pretty concerned 
about debris, but I want to go ahead and look at it more closely because these pictures are not actually representative of what, uh, of what debris is. So, question for us to think about. Just how crowded is space? How much stuff is out there? And since it's hard to imagine space, I want to first imagine it as not a space problem, but an, air, but an airplane, but a troposphere problem. A question of how crowded is the Earth's troposphere? And so here's a little quite t test for you. At any number of time, at any one moment in time, there are about 10,000 aircraft in the air around the Earth, in the troposphere, typically somewhere below 10 kilometers. So between zero feet of elevation or zero kilometers of elevation and 10 kilometers of elevation, 10,000 planes are flying at any one time. How big would I need to draw this cube in order to go ahead and make sure, if they were randomly spaced, that at least two aircraft were in it most of the time? How big do you think the cube would need to be? And I'm happy to take, guess, you know, just toss out numbers that come off your head. How big do what I need to draw the cube to make sure I captured two airplanes at any one time? How much? 20 kilometers, I got, a, I got a bid for 20 kilometers. Can I go higher? What is that? Come on, be, don't be shy. How much? 2,000, well, okay. So it's a lot that high, 80 kilometers. And since obviously they don't actually fly 80 kilometers high, it's really about 200 kilometers by 200 kilometers by 10 kilometers. In order to reliably capture two planes in the same volume of space in the troposphere, you'd need a cube about 80 kilometers large. Now, it just so happens that the size of an aircraft is something like 2.5 times 10 to the minus cubic kilometer, times to the minus uh, 5 cubic kilometers. So you can go through a whole bunch of fancy math if you want to, but if they're randomly spaced in the troposphere, that would mean that there would be a one in a billion billionth chance that two planes would be close enough to collide with each other. That's the picture in air. Now you know that it's the picture in air because if you go outside and you look up in the sky, most of the time you don't see a plane unless you happen to live near an airport. And by the way, that's a very important point because airplanes aren't randomly distributed in the air. There are specific places they fly, specific places they fly to and from. There are areas of intense crowding and there are areas of pretty open. So if you're flying transatlantic or transpacific, it's pretty, pretty few aircraft there. If you're in the main air corridors over the center of the United States or in a terminal controlled area near an airport, the density of aircraft becomes high. And so what do we do? We regulate where aircraft fly. We regulate it so they don't go ahead and collide. And we've done that ever since a major collision happened back in the 1950s over the Grand Canyon, which led to the formation of the Federal Aviation Administration. Okay, now let's go ahead and move to space. There's approximately one million pieces of debris in low Earth orbit, defined as between 300 kilometers and 1,200 kilometers or three, uh, uh, above the Earth's surface. About one million pieces of debris greater in size than one centimeter. We use one centimeter because below one centimeter we can protect uh, satellites from harm, but above one centimeter we really can't. And we can't track things down to one centimeter. We can only track them at between the five and 10 centimeter level, but there's about a million pieces of debris estimated by NASA in that how big would the cube need to be to go ahead and capture two of those one centimeter objects? Guesses. A thousand? A little bit lower. Five hundred? The answer is 106 kilometers. hundred, which isn't that much bigger than air traffic, which only had 10,000, right? This is a million. So it's, um, so it's two orders of magnitude larger in the number of pieces, but it's two orders of magnitude larger plus some um, in the actual volume. On the other hand, these are not 2.5 times 10 to the minus 5 cubic kilometers a piece. They're a cubic centimeter a piece or less. So their chance of being, in the, of being close enough to one another to hit each other is one trillion trillionths if they were randomly distributed in space. That's not very large. If you bring that now down to just the larger pieces of space, that, of uh, craft that are in space or debris that's in space, things that are 10 centimeter or larger, those only number 20,000. 
they would need a box about a thousand kilometers by about a thousand kilometers on side to go ahead and assure that any two of those were in the same place. So the chances of things colliding in space are pretty low, not zero. And we all know that things actually do collide in space, and that's because they don't act in random manner. They act in prescribed orbits, where many people have the same needs to be in the same orbits. But unlike aircraft, where we know that when we want to go ahead and fly in prescribed airspace, and therefore we should guide them, in space, we don't do that. We don't tell people where to, go, where to fly. We don't direct them with the active space control, if you will. And so the random nature of our protection in space would save us if they were randomly distributed, but there's some waterfront property in space, whether it's in low, low Earth orbit, whether it's sun synchronous orbit, or specific inclinations for communication satellites in LEO orbit, or specific altitudes. There are some, there are some waterfront properties, so to speak, that makes people all want to be in the same place. And so that leads to some collisions. This is the actual numbers. This is the actual data. And you'll see that this is now uh, in the vertical, um, on the vertical axis here, you see that this is the number of objects per cubic kilometer in, uh, at a certain altitude level. The peak is at 800 kilometers, uh, at 800 kilometers altitude. One times 10 to the minus, about five times 10 to the minus, seven pieces of debris per cubic kilometer. Hopefully, if you took that number and you multiplied it by what I said earlier, you'd come out with one. And if you don't, it's probably my fault. Um, so uh, so that's, that's the actual concentration of debris by altitude range. And here's what's contributing to most of it. If you look, if you look at the bottom, at the lower side of this, down in the t 10 to the minus eighth, uh, one to the minus uh, eighth uh, end b below, that's where most of the active satellites lie. And that little bump you see at 1,500 kilometers tend to be mostly active satellites, and most of the things that are down below that are active satellites. But you see th two pronounced peaks on this chart, one in red, one in green. The green one is when a, an Iridium satellite collided with a Cosmos satellite in 2009, and the red one is when the Chinese shot down one of their own weather satellites. Those two events, both happening around 700 to 800 kilometers, contributed to this huge peak in debris that we see in the 800 kilometer range. Interestingly enough, the Iridium satellite that hit the Cosmos satellite was actually alerted to the fact that they were likely to have a collision. In fact, they had to go ahead and maneuver twice in order to successfully hit the Cosmos satellite. Um, that wasn't their intent, obviously. But that's the problem. We don't know well enough where each of these things are, so we can give people heads up that there's a possible collision. But in most cases, we don't have the data to go ahead and support any kind of traffic control, much as you would have in a civilian aircraft that we talked about earlier, you know exactly where that aircraft is, you know exactly where it's heading, you know where the other aircraft are heading. You can therefore ex use some aspect of control to go ahead and prevent a collision from happening. But we don't have that for space. And this is what the problem looks like today when we only have about 1,400 active satellites. That number is less than the number of satellites that will be launched by OneWeb and SpaceX if their promises come true in the next two years, and they're just the first of many who are launching many satellite constellations that will number in the many thousands. And they all want to be in the same place. So what do we do about that? Because even though the chances of collision are small, if they were randomly distributed, they won't be randomly distributed. They'll all be looking for that waterfront space property, and they're going to go ahead and cause collisions in the future. So. Um, Let's talk now about some of the regulatory aspects of this and how we deal with it. The first regulation that people typically look at is this so-called 25-year rule. Um, the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, uh, over the last uh, several decades, has promulgated a standard that most, people, most countries have adopted that says, listen, you should deorbit inactive pieces of, of sa inactive satellites within 25 years. Now, the reason they came up with that rule has nothing to do with space debris. 
It has to do with our ability to protect damage on the ground by, de by randomly deorbiting satellites. So it was designed to go ahead and, and say, hey, listen, we can't predict population growth in any area greater than 25 years out. And if you really want to predict how many people might get hit by falling spacecraft, you should get them down before 25 years is out so you can predict accurately what the, what the, what the likelihood of harm is on the ground. For those of you who, are, who, are, who care about the numbers, your prediction has to result in less than one in, a 1 in 10,000 chance that somebody on the ground will be hit by space deorbiting space debris. If your prediction ends up in less than 1 in 10,000, then you can go ahead and launch that object into space. But that's all based upon the needs of what's happening on the ground, not upon the needs of what's happening in space. 25 years is a long time for pieces of debris to be up there because what we've seen over time is the mass in orbit, this is a chart of the mass of, of uh, debris and satellites and everything else in orbit, this mass has gone up and up continuously uh, since we began the space age many decades ago. Uh, we are now at over seven, metric, uh, seven million ton kilograms of mass in orbit and growing, as you can see, fairly linearly over the last several years. We're going to put a lot more mass up in orbit, and if we don't bring it down more quickly, this number will continue to grow. Last year, for comparison purposes, we, came, we brought down 6,000 kilo, 6, kilograms of, um, of debris, of space junk, um, but we put up millions more. The second thing we need to do is to improve our space situational awareness. We need to track better. We need to be able to tell an Iridium satellite that, that it is likely to go ahead and hit or not hit another satellite, and we need to be able to give it direction on where to maneuver safely so it won't go ahead and accidentally hit something. Today, most of our space situational awareness is aimed at maintaining defense um, security in space, not, maintained at, not aimed at maintaining environmental security in space. This is a big problem because all the U.S.'s space surveillance assets are, real, are for the most part owned by the U.S. military and they don't really care about collisions that much. You'd think they would, but they don't because that's not their job. Unfortunately, nobody else has the job to do it. Along with better space situational awareness would be aids to navigation. Every civilian aircraft that you fly in has an aid to navigation, it has some sort, of a, uh, some sort of a transponder that tells the folks on the ground where that is. But we don't have that in space and there's no requirement for that in space. Lastly, orbital location filing. If you're an aircraft pilot, you have to file a flight plan, you have to follow specific flight routes. You, if you're flying eastbound, you have a certain car, uh, altitude you fly at. If you're flying westbound, you have a certain altitude you're flying at. These rules are well known and established, and everybody follows those rules, but in space, anybody can fly anywhere they'd like to. So if Elon Musk puts up a constellation at 11,000 kilometers, Greg Weiler from OneWeb can put up a constellation at 11,000 kilometers, and unless they happen to be very lucky, those two constellations are probably going to interact in ways that aren't, very fun, aren't fun for the rest of us. But there's nothing that prevents, that, for, that asks them to coordinate with each other, now, they probably will for business purposes, but there's nothing that says they should, and there's nothing that says that once you put a constellation up at 11,000 kilometers, you own that shell of space. In fact, the opposite is true. By treaty, you in fact cannot own a location in space. You're not allowed to go ahead and call a specific orbit as your orbit and nobody else can fly in that orbit. And yet, that, and that was a great treaty um, issue back in the 60s when only two countries were flying satellites in orbit, but today there needs to be coordination amongst all of the players. So that's how the regulations in the U.S. should go ahead and evolve. The problem is these regulations interact with treaties. I've already mentioned some of the treaty work. Of the four issues that I talked to on the previous chart, three of them would require the U.S. to go ahead and renegotiate the Outer Space Treaty to go ahead and renegotiate how we coordinate with other nations. In the geosynchronous belt, we've done this for years. The International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, coordinates filings amongst all the member nations to make sure that orbital locations in the geosynchronous belt don't interfere with each other in terms of frequency. We've never done it in terms of positional interference, and yet that is a critical element of what's coming in the future. 
it's, this is a really hard nut to crack because people don't want to give up their sovereign rights about where to fly in space, and yet if we don't, we're likely to see a lot of collisions occur in the future. And there's one other thing we'd have to go ahead and deal with from a treaty perspective, and that's how do you go ahead and get rid of the debris that's already up there? The fact of the matter is, is that we don't really care about one centimeter pieces of debris hitting other one centimeter pieces of debris. What we care about is moderately sized pieces of debris, five to 10 centimeters, hitting really large pieces of debris, such as satellites, because that makes a whole bunch of other small uh, fragments. And so we need to empty out some of those old rocket bodies and old satellites that can no longer maneuver that will be up there for eons unless we figure out how to get them. These are the critical issues that we have to deal with in terms of the international community to figure out how do we prevent debris from getting in the way of our economic livelihood in space. And this is not just a U.S. issue. This is an international issue and it has to be dealt with internationally. The U.S. has been one of the ones who has been standing mostly in the way of this happening, along with some of the other peer nations in the world, because we're all afraid that by agreeing to these treaty limitations, it will inhibit our national security. And yet we all agree to these same rules on the sea and in the air, but we don't agree with them in space because up until, up until recently, space was still a secretive province that few other countries inhabited. But if we actually believe that the future of space is going to be driven by the commercial world, by some of the economic drive that makes space so valuable, we've got to go ahead and learn to get over the national security implications of giving up some of our freedom. And by the way, we really don't give up our freedoms anyway. You see all those boats parked across the harbor in the Navy Yard? Every one of them has what's called an automatic identification system, an AIS on it, that will tell anybody else within the area exactly where that ship is located. And do you know how many times the Navy turns that on in practice? Never. Uh, so they don't actually use the system, but they can if they want to in a crowded harbor. Uh, because that's, that is simply a rule that has promulgated for all ships on the sea. And so when the Navy finds it in their advantage to use that AIS system, they do. But otherwise, they leave it off for military purposes. So you don't have to go ahead and give up your national security uh, prerogatives by going ahead and agreeing to these treaties. You just have to go ahead and use it wisely, just as we've learned to do within the air and on the sea. And the second, pro the second issue that the national security community needs to recognize is that the increase in commercial space is good for U.S. national security, not bad for U.S. national security. Commercial space reduces the cost of getting to space. It reduces the cost of us doing our missions. It goes ahead and gives us options beyond what we can purchase through the defense budget, and it leads, obviously, to better economic, um, better economic results for the United States of America. These are actually all positive national security uh, reactions to a growing commercial space sector. But if we don't start to agree with some of the policy changes that are necessary to keep that sector healthy, um, we could lose all of those benefits. So with that, let me close my comments. I just I did a really quick tour for you uh, across the, over the issues. The bottom line is, is that we do need to support regulatory change to go ahead and, and fully accomplish the goals of space commercialization. But we've got to do that internationally as well. We can't just do it within the U.S. We've got to do it internationally. And the impact on, on U.S. national security will be positive if we go ahead and do those things. With that, I'll conclude my comments and see if you have any questions for me. Thank you very much. Questions, sir? Hold on for a second, you've got a mic coming over here. <laughs> you were too quick with the question. <laughs> Is it live? Yeah. I'd, what I'd like to have you comment on, I'd just like to make an observation based on um, one of the points that you made. Um, <clears throat> I think a great deal of care needs to be in constructing the regulations so they can adapt to reality as we better understand the reality. And the particular instantiation I'm thinking of relates to the 25-year rule. <clears throat> There's a phenomena which is only beginning to be understood and has only been recognized for a small number of years that the atmosphere above 200 
kilometers is gradually collapsing because of greenhouse gas concentrations, which actually cool the upper atmosphere. And it's been collapsing at the rate which is accelerating, but has lately been about 5% per decade. So whoever launched to an altitude that they thought had a 25-year life actually is going to have considerably longer than a 25-year life. And as a result, the debris accumulation will be considerably higher than previously expected. And yet, the people that would have constructed a regulation would have not accounted for that. So I'm just wondering what you think about doing about those kind of issues. Sure. Um, I, I couldn't hear. There's such a big echo in here. I couldn't hear everything you said, but I think you, uh, but let me make sure I got it right. The 25-year rule is great if you calculate it based upon the normal solar cycle, um, but our, uh, the atmosphere, because of global warming, is not going to be at the same level we believe it's going to be over the next 25 years. Is that how you're asking? Yes, and it's actually sort of the counterintuitive aspect that at the high altitudes, it's actually cooling and collapsing. Yep, sure. Um, so obviously, uh, obviously a, a, real, a real issue. Um, that's one of the problems with the 25-year rule. It's applied by the people who are going ahead and designing their own missions, and they get to apply it in any way they want to, and there's not even international agreement on exactly what the atmosphere uh, looks like. Uh, the reality is, is that most of the things that say they're going to deorbit in less than 25 years probably aren't. I remember some launches that we did when I was at the Space and Missile Systems Center, and based upon the actual final tra injection trajectory, we, we could go ahead and say that either the satellite was going to re-enter in 25 years or 25 centuries, but we weren't sure which one. Okay. So, so, so the numbers are pretty sloppy in the first place. Uh, and, and really, this is a matter of planning, of planned deorbiting. Um, for most people, and in, so, in, in the cases of CubeSats, which I, which I made jokes about earlier, but really um, they're very important for, for us progressing in, our, in research in many, many ways. Um, I view that things like CubeSats should follow the same rules, for example, if you're a pilot that a VFR pilot um, follows, where you, fl you would always fly below the altitude of the space station for a CubeSat, unless there was a mission requirement that made you not be able to do that, so that it would, even if it didn't naturally deorbit by 25 years, it wouldn't be a hazardous navigation for anybody else who was flying around. And if you were going to have to fly that CubeSat higher than, 20, higher than the space station, well, then you should go ahead and put enhanced drag mechanisms on there, which are, which are state-of-the-art, very easily to go ahead and implement, even within a, any, even within a one U CubeSat, uh, to go ahead and assure you got it at least as rapid deorbit as you possibly could. Easy regulations to enforce, doesn't cost a lot of money, would not hamper uh, the kind of work that's going on yet, would still keep the environment clean. So thank you very much for that question. So appreciate the talk, especially as somebody from more of the aircraft side of the spectrum, it's a good exposure. What I'm also curious about is what about the, say, global approach for, well, space janitors, somebody to clean up the space junk that's already up there. Would that be a more economical approach than trying to get a treaty renegotiated? Yeah, you'll have to excuse me. Just put down the mic and ask me the question without all the echo. <laughs> Sure. Um, so, a lot of people have talked about space cleanup, uh, but because of the because the Outer Space Treaty uh, basically says, uh, and it, it actually says um, that you can't interfere with the space you can't interfere with the space assets of any other nation. So only the nation who has created a piece of an object in space is allowed to go ahead and touch that object in space. And for almost all pieces of debris that are smaller than about two or three centimeters, we don't know where they came from. Um, and so we, we have no rights to salvage. This is the right of salvage. When I talk about rights of salvage, you might think about bringing that valuable gold tin foil back to the earth. No, no, we're just talking about getting rid of stuff in space. The problem is you have to get permission from the owner in, for space to go ahead and salvage, which is different than on this, at the sea, by the way. In this, on the sea, if you have a ship that is a derelict, that has become a piece of floating debris in the sea, any operator is allowed to go ahead and salvage that vessel. And he has to at least offer it back to the owner, but he's allowed to salvage it to go ahead and make and reduce its hazard navigation. But that rule doesn't apply in space right now, and that doesn't, that's one of those treaty things that we need to work on so you can eliminate those hazards to navigation, absolutely. 
I see John getting ready to give me the hook. Are we out of time, John? No, one more question. All right, good. Sir. Um, are all, all, do all these pieces of debris share similar specific momentum vector? Or are they randomly or chaotically oriented? They're uh, chaotic. Um, they're, not, they're not random because they all resulted from a launch that was aimed at a specific, um, a specific orbital location, unless they're the result of collisions. But even the ones that are the results of collisions still tend to stay in the, um, in the, uh, original, in the original orbit. So they're not random at all. Um, eventually, if we give it millennia, they'll all end up in equatorial orbit, but we probably don't have that much time uh, to do it. And they tend to be mostly in polar orbit um, and in high inclined uh, orbit of about 66 degrees or so. so. Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank Mr. Lavera for such a fitting tribute to William Duran. So if we could please give him a round of applause. <laughs> and now, on behalf of AIAA, it is my privilege to present you with the Duran Certificate and Medal. So with that, we hope you've enjoyed today's program, sponsored by Lockheed Martin. Their generous support of this lecture is greatly appreciated, as by doing so, they continue their long and storied tradition of supporting the kinds of discussions that will drive our industry forward in our quest to evolve technology and to better understand the universe we inhabit. The afternoon sessions will begin uh, shortly, so thanks to all of you for joining us, and have a wonderful week here at AIAA SciTech Forum. Thank you very much, everybody.